I think that for those of us who are not spring chickens anymore, the, it probably in our lifetime we can look back and say, we're not talking about in the history of our country or in the history of the world, things are worse than ever. They're not worse than ever. The world has been worse than this. It, our nation has not been this bad in any, any of our lifetimes. But one of the things that I mentioned last night was one of the most alarming things is the confusion that's coming from those that claim to speak on behalf of Christ. It, I'm not surprised when the world is confused. I mean, if Oprah Winfrey gives bad advice, I, I don't, it doesn't shake me up. I expect Oprah Winfrey to try her best and give bad advice. But if a person that says, I belong to Christ, and this is what God this is the way God has laid out for us, and it's the happiest, best way. And then if they say something that goes against God, his character, his word, then that bothers you. So in all of our troubles that we're facing, there's a lot of religious voices, especially with the Internet. There's a lot of religious voices. How do I know who is speaking on behalf of the Lord. Well, of course, we have the, the word of God, but a lot of people are quoting the Bible, and, but they're saying it different ways. So how do I know who God trusts? Who has God sent? And, you know, in your own life, you want to help people. You want, when you speak to your children or grandchildren, you, when you speak to your coworkers or your neighbors, or when you speak to the person sitting by you in church or when you preach from a pulpit, I want my words to be words that, that God works through. I want to be the kind of man that can be trusted to speak on his behalf. What kind, of, what kind of man is that? Well, Christ was that man. And the Gospel of John is full of individual statements there, but we're having to limit ourselves to Paul right now. Paul was that man. But the fact that we have to validate our claims at times to be speaking on behalf of the Lord is not a bad thing. We, we do get preachers will oftentimes we, we complain when people don't, you know, just take what we say. We say, well, I, I told you this. And, then, you know, and their attitude is, well, so and so said this. I don't know who to believe. And you think, well, believe me, because I'm quoting a Bible. But you remember the pattern of Christ. In John four, Christ defends his. In John 5, Christ defends his claim to be speaking on behalf of God. And he says, you know, John the Baptist told you who I was. These other people tell you who I am. You know, you see these miracles. A voice from heaven told you who I am. And then he said, my life, the, the works that I do, I do the works the Father gave me to do. They declare who I am. John 10, Jesus says to the crowds when they get angry because they realize he's claiming to be the son of God and they want to put him to death. Jesus says to them, if I do not do the works of my father, then do not believe me. I've seen a lot of banners in churches and, you know, you see a, a lot of things on church signs. Usually they're kind of heartbreaking. They're, they're trying to be funny and quippy. And I've never seen a church sign saying, if we, the people of this church, don't do the works of our Father, don't listen to us. Can you imagine if the church put that as a banner above your pulpit? You might take it kind of personally if next week, you know, Doug comes up and there's this banner. If Doug doesn't do what Christ commands him to do, don't listen to Doug. But that's a very valid pattern. Paul had to validate his claims to be speaking on behalf of the living God so many times. Paul preached in a, in, a, in a world different than ours 20 years ago, but ours is becoming very much like his, and again, we complain. I, 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 I quote the Bible to somebody, and they say, well, that's your book. Maybe there's other books, you know, and that bothers us, but you do know that the New Testament, that was the scene. Paul shows up and Corinth and says, I want to tell you about God. And they could have said, so which God? Because we, we know a whole bunch of gods. we got Roman gods and Greek kind of reflections of these Romans and gods. And then we've got these gods and we have Gnostics and we have these and we have Jews over here. We have a thousand options for God. So you can just add yours to the list. And Paul says, no, mine is the exclusive God. 
Oh, well, then that's trouble. Got any evidence for that? At the end of chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians, Paul says in verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, you go out to the world, you can imagine Paul saying this to a, to a Corinthian that grew up with a thousand gods that they could sacrifice to. You take your pick. And Paul shows up in town and says, I am telling you the truth. In fact, God is, is pleading with your soul through me. Well, that person is a nut unless God is pleading through them. But those are your only two options. I don't know why anybody believes anything we say. I guess that they don't throw us in the mental home, you know, a mental hospital, because they just think we're harmless nuts. You know, oh, God lives in me. I'm the temple of God. I'm a child of God. I, I'm speaking to you as an ambassador from God. I mean, I would think that that should land us in the mental hospital. But I think that they think, well, you can think what you want. As long as you're harmless, you just stay over there. But these are realities. But who can say, I am pleading with you and God is pleading through me. I am an ambassador of Christ. Who can say that with validity? You don't want to be an ambassador and you show up at another nation in, in, in the midst of some very important talks. You know, and an ambassador is only, he's only given authority to say what his nation gives him authority to say. He can't say, look, my president says this, but look, personally, I think this. Like, <laughs> you would yank him off the field. You were sent with my message, not your message. And you have to behave in a way that represents the person that sent you if you're an ambassador. But what if you say you're an ambassador? If, you know, if I go over to Britain and I walk up to the gates of Buckingham Palace, of course, you can't get past the gates anyway, but if I knocked on the gates and I was dressed, you know, like a, an important person and I said, I am the ambassador from America to Britain, I have a lot to say. They wouldn't let me in the gate. They'd say, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, they'd probably put me in a jail. What evidence do you have that you're an ambassador sent from Christ? Not claiming it, that's not enough. Well, Paul gives evidence because every town he goes into, everybody thinks, well, there's a lot of gods. How do I know that you speak for the real God? You say you do, but how do I know it? And then, sadly, even in the churches, when Paul leaves, false teachers are always ready to try to distort what he says. There's always an enemy at work against God's people, and the liar comes through his instruments, and they say, Paul, well, he seems he seems pretty impressive in his letters, but, uh, you know, face to face, he's not that impressive. Maybe he's not really all he says yet. So how does Paul demonstrate to the Corinthians that he is pleading with them on behalf of God, and therefore they ought to take what he says seriously? I don't think that the problem that we're having today is that there aren't enough people talking on behalf of, you know, religiously. It's that maybe there are not enough people that that God is trusting with a message. And even those that are saying the right things, sometimes we say them with wrong attitudes or wrong patterns in our life. And so there's no weight to them. It's as if you show up as an ambassador. So again, my silly illustration showing up at Buckingham Palace. But what if President Biden walks up right behind me and says, he is not from us. He doesn't speak for the states. Don't listen to him. So we get up in the pulpit and we preach and we preach and we say Bible phrases, and, but we're kind of off on our own thing, doing our own thing, building our own little kingdom for our pride. And what if Christ is saying, the whole time you're preaching, he doesn't really speak for me. I know he's quoting Bible verses occasionally. Don't listen to him. So... What kind of men can be trusted to speak on behalf of God? Well, 2 Corinthians 6 is a great place to look. Christ says, if I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me. Paul gives his list. Here is how you can see, and it's a great pattern for us. And following Paul's pattern here is, again, it's following Christ. So look at chapter 6, verse 1. 
and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So let's think about this working together with him. Co-workers with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. We are God's fellow workers or co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. So we're, we are familiar with this. We're co-workers with God. We're not working on our own. But let's think about that. Okay, let's be very honest about that. If we are working with God, he is the... He is, you know, the owner of the company, and we are the apprentice. We don't have apprenticeships as much nowadays as they used to. But let's say a young man gets out of school and he says, I, I want to be whatever. You know, I want to be a, a bricklayer. I want to be this or that, and, and I don't want to go to school for it. It really doesn't seem to be helpful. So, but Mr. So-and-so in church, he owns a company that does what I want to do, and he is really successful. Everybody says he's just the best. So you go to him and you say, um, I- I'd like to work for you. I'd like for you to teach me to do what you do. So kind of like an apprentice. And the successful man says, all right, we'll show up at work. And the young man says, yeah, great. Let me see. I like to work Tuesdays. I, s- I start about 11. I don't do Mondays. Is that how it works? Have you ever thought about what it, what it would be like for you to be a co-worker with God, and obviously he's the boss and not us, and we're the apprentice. Just some very kind of down-to-earth things. If you are hired on to be trained and to work alongside the boss, think of things that would be included. You join the boss at work, his work. He doesn't show up at your place saying, what do you want to learn to do today? I'll teach you what you want to learn. No, he says, I'm here working. You join me. We're going to do my work, but I'm going to teach you how to do my work. So when we, when we go into the ministry, God is not interested in us telling him we have a new cool idea for how to make the church grow and revitalize it and do better than the other generations. And if God will just come over to our part and, and go ahead and fund it and promote it, well, but that's not how it works. We... We are under him. We do his work. If we're doing his work, we do his methods. Can you imagine a, a young man saying, I want to learn to do roofing? And so he apprentices on with a, with a mature roofer who's made a lot of money doing it really well. And the young man comes and says, you know, after about 20 minutes, he looks at the roof and he says, I, don't, I think there's easier ways to do this. I, I think I, I've got an idea how we could do this better. I mean, actually, that does happen all the time. You know, if you ever employ 20-year-olds, it's a strange age, isn't it? They're not kids anymore, but they don't know anything yet. So you got to work with them, but you can't treat them like a 10-year-old. They're an adult, but you've got to be patient as they learn. Yeah, you, you know some things, but you've got a lot more to learn. So let's kind of not be telling the boss how to do everything today. So we come to God and we say, well, you know, okay, so we'll do your kind of work. But I think I've got some ideas how this could be done differently. Well, God is not, that's not co-working with God. So we go, we do what he does. We do it how he does it. His methods become our methods. When he starts work, we start work. And we work until he says we're done working. We work at his pace. We don't run ahead of him. We don't lag behind him. And the confidence that we have that when we're done, even though we aren't really great at it, the confidence that it will be done right is that he is at work and we're joining him. The confidence that we'll have all the knowledge we need and all the tools we need and all the supplies we need is because it's his company, not ours. And if you're going to go to work with someone like that, then I guess it goes without saying that you're going to listen a lot more than you're going to talk. So when Paul says we are co-workers with God, how does that work in a spiritual way? Well, look at what he says in verse 3 and verse 4. He commends himself. He says, here's my evidence that I'm really an ambassador sent from Christ. I am working together with God himself. What's the evidence? Well, because of the greatness of the new covenant, 
Paul can say these things and they're true. And there's two general categories of evidence. There's the category of what I don't do and there's the category of what I do do. All right? So I don't do these things and I do these things. And this you see, by this you see evidence that I'm speaking on behalf of Christ. So in verse 3, wonderful little phrase. Giving no cause for offense in anything. All right? In nothing, giving cause for offense. Not that people won't be offended, but no one could ever point at Paul and say, it's your fault I'm offended. So giving no cause for genuine offense in anything. Then in the next verse, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God. So how do we know you're a servant of God and you're speaking for God? Well, number one, I am careful by the grace of God to give no cause for offense in anything. And number two, by the grace of God, day by day, I use every opportunity in everything I commend myself as a servant of Christ. Do you see the universal nature of those statements? It's quite frightening. Verse 3, no cause in anything, in nothing. Verse 4, in everything, commending myself as a servant. So in nothing in my life, are you seeing something that would cause you to say, I want nothing to do with his Jesus? And in every situation, I use these situations as a a way of being a, a billboard for showing you Christ, and I show you thereby that I am serving Christ, not myself. This is Paul's pattern. Let's take those quickly. In nothing giving an offense, Paul refuses to do anything that would discredit his claim to be a servant of God. Way back in the Reformation, as the Protestant church is forming and, you know, as, as a response against Catholicism, and people are, you know, saying terrible things about the Protestants and their preachers. And John Calvin wrote this, Satan aims to discredit the gospel by the faults in her ministers. If he succeeds in bringing the ministers into contempt, all hope of progress is gone. If you're in a town where there's a little group of Protestants that have sprouted up in the 1500s, and you're saying, the scripture is the guide. You know, by Christ alone, grace alone, through following scripture alone, not the Pope. Woo! Some wacky heretics down there. Let's watch them a little bit. In nothing, give them a reason to doubt that what you're saying is true. In everything, Commend yourselves as people who serve God and not yourselves. If he can get the true minister who brings the truth to discredit the truth by his life, all hope of progress is gone. So how does Paul not discredit and how does he give credit? Well, in nothing giving an offense. That means, obviously, open sin. The minister doesn't say to himself that because he's saved by grace, he can live in known open sin. But guys, that's, that's not very hard. There's plenty of ways to be sinful behind closed doors. You don't have to go to the movie theater and watch something that's bad. You don't have to stop at the adult bookstore that has three big X's above it. And people say, was that the preacher's car in that place? You just, you have an internet, you have a phone, you have an iPad. We can really discredit everything we say about Christ secretly. But let's start with the open sins. We avoid those. I don't want to do those. I don't want to discredit the Christ I'm representing. But if you're a man that's going to be trusted by God, it has to be more than that. There are areas of conscience You know what I mean? Areas, we call them kind of gray areas. That's probably not the best way to describe them. But there are areas, Paul talks about this a lot in the latter half of Romans, where Greeks, uh, you know, uh, 
Gentiles and Jews are smashing together in the same church. And uh, because of the political situation, the Jews have been gone for a while. Now they're back. Well, now the Gentiles are leading the church for a while. And now the old leaders, the Jews, come back. And, of course, they're Jewish Christians. But, like, who, who's going to be in charge? And how do we mesh? And so Paul has to write a lot about these areas where it's not necessarily right or wrong, but how you respond to people in this situation, that is right or wrong. And so if you have a weaker brother and this really causes him to stumble, then don't do that. Don't use your freedom for self-indulgence and hurting other Christians. So there is the aspect of laying aside your personal rights at times to things that aren't necessarily wrong, but you lay them aside for the sake of not in anything, in nothing, discrediting or harming the gospel. Are we allowed to drink alcohol? Well, it just depends who you talk to. If you're under 40 and you call yourself reformed and you don't drink alcohol, they suspect that maybe you don't understand the gospel and you're a legalist and you probably are not even a Christian. If you're over 40 and you don't go around saying you're reformed, then if you did have a beer in your refrigerator, your friends would think you're not a Christian. Well, Paul talks about areas like that. I don't have alcohol in my house. My, my, wife, my wife gets mad at me if we go to a fancy, on, a, on an anniversary, if we go to a fancy hotel and they put a little thing of, some little thing of wine, like it's a little sherry or something. I don't, I grew up in a family who's teetotal, I don't even know what they are. So there's this little thing and it's got this much grape juice in it, you know, but it's alcoholic. And I'm like, I wonder what it tastes like. So like, eh, I don't really like it. And my wife goes, you just drank that? There's a woman who cleans the room and she sees your Bible and just see that's empty. Like she'll think you're a drunk. I'm like, Misty, I can't even feel that. I don't think that's drunk, you know. And so my wife, I'm being a little exaggerated, but not really. She does think like, you just drank that. And now, like, what do you want me to do? You want to pour half full and put water in it? And so it looks like I didn't touch it. Like, it's not wrong. That wasn't a sin. But I don't drink because there are times where that would damage people. I remember a friend of mine that, was a, that went to Piper's church for a year to be trained. He's a very helpful guy. He's in the Behold Your God study. And he heard of a fellow. So this is not, his name is Jordan Thomas. He's very encouraging. Has a pastor, uh, he's a pastor in a church that they planted in the inner city in Memphis. Jordan is so encouraging. But he heard of a guy who, you know, he's a young reformed guy. So he's, he's like, he, he gets hired on at a church. And he tells him, now I just want you to know I drink. And he says, so when you come to my house, you know, he said, now I only drink two beers a day. That, I limit myself, two beers a day. But if you come to my house, I'm going to have a beer in my hand. <laughs> and one of my friends leaned over and said, it's going to be a warm beer, you know, if you're carrying around two beers all day. I can tell you're over 40s because you don't think that's funny at all. But, all right. I think that's stupid. You know, like, why do that? Y y there's people in the church that you might damage. But that's an area of conscience. The Bible doesn't say you can't have alcohol ever in your stomach. It, but it does say a lot about drunkenness. And it says a lot about laying aside your personal preferences for the sake of others. When Paul says, I am all things to all men, he's not saying, I adjust the Bible to fit whoever's sitting in front of me. He's a Jew, but he is willing to lay aside all of his Jewish sensibilities and live like a Gentile, as long as it doesn't go against the Lord, for the sake of the Gentiles. And when he goes back among Jews, he is willing to accept some of the restraints of Judaism to bring the gospel to the Jews. And he doesn't say, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm free now. In nothing giving offense. Hudson Taylor, one of my all-time favorites. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China. At the end of his life, a number of his friends wrote about his life, especially men that had worked with him, you know, for four decades. One of his oldest friends gave this long description of Taylor's life, how it looked on the mission field, even at the hardest moments. And what he said about Hudson Taylor has haunted me. He said this, at the end of this long description, he used this phrase, there was a life 
that bore looking into. It's one thing to preach a sermon that everybody thinks is helpful. It's another thing for a person to come and follow you for a couple of years and be next to you for years in the hardest times in your marriage and in the best times of the church and the hard times and to, at the end of your life for them to say, that was a life that bore looking into. You could look deep into Hudson Taylor's personal life and it did not contradict his gospel. John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, 100 years before Hudson Taylor, was also a very, very popular pastor and a pastor to pastors. He actually became a pastor because George Whitfield, when Newton was very young, he went to hear Whitfield preach over and over and over. You know, he's kind of a groupie, and Whitfield had coffee with him a lot and, and eventually said, man, have you considered God calling you to preach? And so Newton did pray about it and became a wonderful pastor. Newton had a prayer as a preacher. Very simple. God, make me to speak as I ought and to live as I speak. Amy Carmichael, missionary, after both those men, early 1900s, Amy Carmichael, missionary to India, she wrote and she said she had a prayer. God, Make me to be what I appear, what people think of me. Oh, she's such a wonderful missionary. Make me to be what I appear. Make me to stand to my conscience clear. Do you have a life that bears looking into? In nothing, in nothing am I willing to give offense, genuine offense. In nothing am I willing to claim my rights to have something I want and by doing that, I am contradicting the message of Christ. And I'm really not serving Christ anymore, am I? I'm not an ambassador for Christ. I'm an ambassador for John. Second category, in everything, commending myself as a servant of God. And this is so much more. And this is one that we tend to treat as optional. If we talk to young men going into ministry and we really give them a strong talking to about holiness and being careful with their thoughts and their eyes and, you know, guarding their marriage and, and don't, get your, don't put your hands in the church account and take money. And well, we give them a long list of don't, 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 because we know so many people that did that and fell. But that is not enough to be a coworker with God. To commend yourself as a servant of the living God, it's not just that you don't do the bad things. Use every opportunity to commend yourself as a servant of God, servant that God sent. And that shows up in the second half of verse 4 down through verse 10. Now, again, we don't have time. But I want to read the list. And this is a list of hard things. And Paul gives no complaint. But what he says is this. These, every one of these hard situations, and many of them are, sin he's being treated sinfully. I, j I just use all of them to just plaster on my life. I serve God, not Paul. So even in these hard times, I'm happy. I serve God in the new covenant. It's worth it. Look at what he says. In everything, commending ourselves as servants of God. In much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments. Guys, three years ago in COVID, it's like half the church wanted to get on the crazy bus and the other half drove it. I asked Jordan Thomas in Memphis, I said, you having lots of troubles? Hold on. You having lots of troubles with the church and the COVID issues? And I'm not giving you my political opinions about it. I'm just saying, is the church like all distracted from the work of the kingdom because of masks? He said, oh man, he wrote back, he said, masks, greatest persecution the church has ever endured since the New Testament times. He was joking, but that's how we acted. Mask? Oh, my American rights. Oh, they're, you're stupid. You're just being sheep. Take those masks off. I hated masks. But in every little thing and every big thing, commending yourself as one 
who is willing to lay aside personal rights at times, not God's rights, personal rights for the sake of the gospel. Yeah, you had a question? Which one? Yeah, 2 Corinthians 6, 4. By the way, guys, if you want the notes from these talks because I'm going too quickly, I'd be glad to send them to you. Just let Doug know that you want them, and I'll give Doug the notes, and he can shoot them in an email to you. So imprisonments and tumults. Tumults, by the way, is um, mobs uprising and, you know, taking them in hand. In labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger. Now, those are hardships. Now, look at these. In purity. How do we know Paul speaks on behalf of God? Look at the purity of his motives. In knowledge, he studies. He says what God says because he studied the word. In patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love. In the word of truth, in the power of God. By the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. And then again, he goes into these, all these different circumstances he finds himself in. By glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers, yet true. Unknown, yet well known. As dying, yet behold, we live. As punished, yet not put to death. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor men, but making many rich. As having nothing, but possessing all things. Paul just gives all these, you know, it's like this is the craziness of the ministry. And in every one of these situations, without exception, in all things, not most, not the fair situations, in all things, commending myself, I'm just a servant, a servant that God sends. So... In a world with so many voices, who can be trusted to speak on behalf of God? Well, Paul says we're co-workers with God. This is how you see it. We dare not claim our rights and jeopardize the gospel. We dare not claim our rights and say, I don't deserve to be treated this way. And when things get really rough, instead of commending himself as a servant of God, he commends himself as a prima donna. I deserve this. The last thing this morning is found in chapter 6, verse 1. It's an encouraging thing. When I think of being a co-worker with God, for many years, I I have thought of it in, I believe, a wrong way. Here's how I thought of it. I thought, you know, the world, the church, it's the field, and you're out working in it. So I'm over in a corner working and working and working. And there's so many needy people, you know, and so you're over in the corner and you think, but I'm a co-worker with God. So I'm hollering at God, God, he's over somewhere else working with somebody else. God, like, I really need help over here. Mrs. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, their kid, my next door neighbor, the person I've been witnessing to, you know, God, help, come and help, come and work, make my weak efforts effective. That is not the picture. Look at. Chapter 6, verse 1, working together with him. Here's how the New American Standard translates it. We also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. It's the we also. I would put that in the front of your Bible, we also. In other words, Paul says this. We are co-workers with God. We also say these things to you. What do you mean, we also? God is at work. God is at work across this little planet through the ages. He is at work. God is at work in your church. God is at work in your home. God is speaking. He's already speaking to the Corinthians. God is already saying to the Corinthians through a thousand ways, don't receive the grace that I'm giving you in vain. Paul, as a co-worker, is coming up alongside God, who's at work. And his voice is added, and he says, yeah, I'm saying the same thing. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. It is quite a different situation from what I thought it was. I'm in the corner working hard, hoping God will show up and help just in time, or God is working everywhere. 
and he points me in the direction of some soul that day. And I come up to them after the sermon, and they say, you know, I've been thinking about those things a lot. And you see, there's a great opening. God is already talking to the person, and you just say, you know what? I also say, and you point them to Christ. You point them to hope, to obedience. It's a wonderful thing to be a co-worker with God because he's the great worker, and we are the we also. And so no moment in ministry is hopeless because we are joining the work of the king. Amazing thing that God would use us, but he does. Men who are insufficient, but they find their sufficiency from God in a superior covenant like Paul. So go back to that covenant and get so such clear views of it that it just permeates everything in your efforts at home and church. You don't lose heart. Go back and look at those chapters for yourself that we just hinted at. Two, three, four, five, and six. How did that great privilege of serving in the new covenant change everything for this man? And how does it change the way I follow Christ as a leader? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the call to serve whether it's in ordinary ways that every Christian is called to speak, to live as salt and light, to grab people by the hand and say, come and see the one who told me all my life, who unveiled my sins, who saved me, and we can guide them to you, to be co-workers with you, in the great unfolding of the kingdom of Christ. We thank you for that, and we thank you that the provision is perfect. The pattern is clear if we'll look. We pray that you would help us to be men who lay aside the despair that so easily grips us because we do care about your reputation, and we feel at times that perhaps it would be better for us not to be serving in this situation, and we would throw our hands up, but you have called and equipped and supply. So help us to set our feet on the path that Paul set his feet on in following Jesus. Help us to follow your son as we lead others. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.